Welcome, I am your host, and this is the Unanswered Questions Podcast. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavour to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy, and as always, leave me some feedback on what you think about the show, and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week we'll be talking about the Freeway Phantom. So, the Freeway Phantom is a media epithet for an unidentified serial killer who was active in Washington, D.C. from April 1971 through to September of 1972. Yeah, it's, it's solvable. 49 years after the Freeway Freeway Phantom hunted girls on the streets near St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Blaine Pardo and Victoria Hester, a father-daughter writing team, are convinced someone could still find a key piece of evidence that will lead police to the killer. He kept textbooks from one of the girls. He kept hair curlers from another girl. He kept shoelaces from another girl. Some family member may stumble across those things and say, why did he keep this junk? April 25th, 1971, 13-year-old Carol Spinks went out to buy groceries. Six days later, police found her body dumped along I-295. Barefoot, she had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Her twin sister still talks to her every day. You know, basically, I just say that, um, I hope she's okay. I'm sure she is. Three months after the first murder, detectives say the phantom struck again, abducting, raping, and murdering 16-year-old Darlinia Johnson. Two people called after spotting her body, but police did not find her until 11 days later. They drove by, right. saw nothing, called the dispatcher and said, 10-8, we don't find any." That's correct. A monster unleashed. Parents warn children in Southeast, so police say the Phantom went Northwest and grabbed 10-year-old Brenda Crockett, then Northeast for 12-year-old Nanamoshia Yates. 18-year-old Brenda Woodward was last seen alive at a bus stop on M Street Northeast. A year later, investigators say the Phantom went back Southeast for 17-year-old Diane Williams, whose sister became a DC police lieutenant. I would want him to come out and say, I did it. Investigators found a note in Brenda Woodward's pocket taunting them. This is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women, he wrote. I will admit the others when you catch me, if you can. Most of these girls were running errands for their parents, innocently playing outside, innocently walking to the store, and they're just gone. The authors name a number of possible suspects, but they think the most likely was a former patient here, a convicted killer named Robert Askins. Robert Askins spent time here in St. Elizabeth's. Um, he what, had a problem with women that went back to the 1930s. He tried to kill women and successfully killed women. Police could never gather enough evidence to charge Askins, and he died in prison a few years ago. But after nearly five decades, Carolyn Spinks still hopes to tell her sister one more thing. Man, we know who it is. In Southeast D.C., Bruce Lachan, WUSA 9. A Prince George's County spokeswoman says the department is still actively investigating these murders. But in D.C., a spokesperson says these cases were purged years ago. They are no longer active investigations. Much of the D.C. evidence has been lost or misfiled, and it's not clear if there's enough left to even recover the killer's DNA. So now we'll get into the murders that he committed. So the first murder was Carol Denise Spinks. So on the evening of April 25th of 1971, 13 year old Spinks from Southeast was sent by an older sister to buy groceries at a 7-Eleven located half a mile away from her home, just across the border in Maryland. On her way home from the store, Spinks was abducted. Her body was found six days later at 2.46 p.m. behind St. Elizabeth's Hospital on a grassy embankment next to the northbound lanes of I-295, about 1,200 feet 
feet south of Suitland Parkway. Examinations revealed she'd been both physically and sexually assaulted and strangled, was dressed but missing her shoes, and had only been killed a few days previously. The next one killed was Darlena Denise Johnson. On July 8th of 1971, Johnson, 16, from Congress Heights, was abducted while en route to a summer job at Oxen Hill Recreation Center. One witness reported having seen Johnson in an old black car driven by an African-American male shortly after her abduction. Eleven days later, her body was located only 15 feet, 5.5 meters, from where Spinks had been found, even though police had been notified of the location of the corpse nearly a week earlier by an anonymous caller who had details only her killer could have known. By that time, Johnson's body, again dressed but without her shoes, was far too decomposed to determine the cause of death or if she had been sexually assaulted, but law enforcement was able to find evidence of strangulation. Then there was Brenda Faye Crockett. So on July 27th of 1971, 10-year-old Brenda Crockett from Northwest failed to return home after having been sent to the store by her mother. About two hours later, around 9.20 p.m., the Crockett's phone rang and was answered by her seven-year-old sister who had waited at home while her family searched the neighborhood. Crockett was on the other line crying, and I quote, a white man picked me up and I'm heading home in a cab, end quote. Crockett told her sister, adding that she believed she was in Virginia before abruptly saying, bye, and hanging up. A short time later, the phone rang again and was this time answered by the stepfather of Crockett. It was Crockett again, and she was merely repeated what she said in the last telephone call, adding, did my mother see me, end quote, and indicating she was alone in a house with a white male. Her stepfather asked her to have the man come to the phone. Heavy footsteps were heard in the background, and Crockett said, I'll see you, and hung up. Authorities quickly concluded that Crockett likely called her home at the behest of the killer, who fed her inaccurate information in order to buy the necessary time to perpetrate the crime and to hamper the investigation. At 5.50am the next day, a hitchhiker discovered Crockett's shoeless body in a conspicuous location on US Route 50 near the Baltimore-Washington Parkway in Prince George County, Maryland. She had been raped and strangled and a scarf was knotted around her neck. Next is Nino Shima Yates. 12-year-old Yates was walking her home around 7pm from a Safeway store in Northeast on October 1st of 1971 when she was kidnapped, raped and strangled. Her body was found within three hours of her abduction just off the shoulder of Pennsylvania Avenue in Prince George's County, Maryland. As with the other cases, her shoes were missing and unidentified green fibres would also be found on her clothing. A witness apparently saw her getting into a blue Volkswagen and although investigated, the lead led nowhere. It was after this murder that the freeway phantom moniker was first used in a Daily News article describing the murders. Then there was Brenda Denise Woodard. After having dinner with a high school classmate on November 15th of 1971, Woodard, 18, from Baltimore, boarded a city bus around 11.30pm to return to a Maryland Avenue home. Approximately six hours later, a police officer discovered her body, which had been stabbed multiple times and strangled in a grassy area near Prince George's County Hospital, along an access ramp to Route 202 from the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. Unlike the other victims, she was still wearing her shoes and a coat had been placed over her chest. One of its pockets contained a very interesting note from the killer. It said, and I quote, this is a tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. Freeway Phantom. Based on a handwriting sample, authorities surmised that the notes written on paper cut from the victim's school notebook had been dictated to and handwritten by Woodard. They also speculated that given the absence of indications of duress in the writing, apart from evidence of dysgraphia, she may have also known her killer. There was Diane Denise Williams. The Phantom's final victim was claimed almost a year later on September 5th of 1972. A 17-year-old Bellow High School senior, Williams cooked dinner for her family and then visited her boyfriend's house. She was last seen boarding a bus at 11.20pm near his house. A few hours later, her strangled body was discovered dumped alongside I-295 just south of the district line. As with other victims, her shoes were missing but no signs of sexual assault were found, although traces of semen, assumed to be from her boyfriend, were found. The Freeway Phantom case has seen a myriad of investigations and garnered much interest over the years. Numerous investigative tips came from the general public by a telephone hotline operated by the Metropolitan Police Department of the District of Columbia, MPDC, and information also came by the way of mail. All these leads were investigated to their logical conclusion. Some leads were evilly proven to be not viable, while others required substantial investigation. The investigation was conducted by a law enforcement task force, which force that included detectives from the MPDC homicide and sex squads, investigators from Prince George County and Montgomery County, Maryland, Maryland State Police, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI. Common practice at the time was that case files at MPDC detective divisions were retained by the detectives assigned to the case. As a result, the Freeway Phantom case files are now incomplete. Some have been discarded entirely, and others are incomplete with pages or articles of evidence having been lost, along with their associated notes, and all the primary or task force investigators have either long retired or are deceased.
deceased. With current evidence and any information of the case from when it happened, no leads produce sufficient evidence for prosecution. This case, which has been closed and open a number of times over its history, is currently open as a cold case in the MPDC Homicide Division. Our award of $150,000 remains open as well. Now we get to the modus operandi. So the Freeway Phantom targeted female children and teens ranging from 12 to 17 years of age. The Phantom would abduct them, usually when they're on their way to or returning from work or an errand. The Phantom would then rape, strangle them, usually manually, and dump their bodies in grassy areas near freeways, hence the name. In the case of the third victim, Brenda Crockett, the Phantom forced her to call her family twice, likely as a way to both taunt them and throw the police off the trail, very similar to the way the Giglo Beach Killer taunted his victim's families with phone calls. The Phantom also strangled her with a scarf. The Phantom also stabbed his fourth victim and left a taunting note in her coat pocket. So now we get to the profile of the Phantom. So the Freeway Phantom has been described as a loner motivated by rage that was focused on overall society. He might have received some kind of psychiatric treatment to help deal with negative emotions like depression and anger towards women. He also could have complained about how society was wronging him and probably tried contacting a person of power by some means. However, said person presumably refused to listen to him, further fueling his anger and leading to the murders. The Phantom also most likely lives in the Washington area as he seems to have knowledge of the region, especially the local stores. He also owns a car or truck which he would drive the distances between the stores where the victims were abducted. The Phantom, after abducting his victims, is assumed to have taken them to abandoned houses where he proceeded to rape the victims multiple times before killing them. He would probably be masked and not want to show his face to his victims. Coroner reports of the Freeway Phantom's victims tell us that the victims were brutally raped with penetration up to nine inches deep with both anal and vaginal assaults taking place. Due to the brutality of the crimes, the police suspected the offender to be a psychopath with a deeper misogynistic hatred towards women. The killer may have military experience due to the skill displayed during the abductions and the lack of evidence at the crime scenes. The perpetrator might have served in the army during the Vietnam War and may have been responsible for some war crimes such as rape and murder during massacres. Now we come to the suspects in the case. So there's the suspects such as the Green Vega rapists. Among those individuals considered suspects were members of a gang known as the Green Vega rapists. Members of this gang were collectively responsible for numerous Washington DC and surrounding Maryland vicinity rapes and abductions that occurred near the Washington Beltway. Local investigations and intimate knowledge of the modus operandi of the Green Vega gang brought them to the forefront. The Green Vega gang members were individually interviewed by the MPDC homicide detective Fickling, Irving and Richardson at Lawton Prison in Virginia where the gang members were serving sentences in conjunction with the successful prosecutions of those crimes in the Superior Court of the District of Columbia. During these interviews one gang member initially implicated another gang member who he said told him he was involved and gave information as to one of the Beltway homicides. This particular inmate who was also serving a sentence at Lawton Prison for the Green Varga convictions. The inmate being interviewed stipulated that he would provide the information only if he could remain unidentified, which was agreed upon. He identified the man who gave him the information, the date and location of the crime, and signature detail which was not provided to the public, but which was only known to the perpetrator and to detectives. That signature information turned out to be correct. The inmate who provided the information said he was not involved in the homicide and provided an alibi which was found to be verifiable. During this period, an election was being held in Maryland and one of the candidates publicly announced to the press that a break had occurred in the Freeway Phantom investigation and provided that an inmate at Lawton Prison had given the information. After that announcement, the inmate who provided the information declined any further interviews and denied that he'd ever provided any information. Which is not surprising really. I mean, when you've been outed as a snitch like that, you're hardly going to say, oh yes, I'm the person that gave this information because as they say snitches get stitches and you will be killed so this person this Maryland candidate during the election is an absolute idiot for giving out that type of information I mean he must have known he or she whoever the candidate was in the election must have known that by doing that they were shooting this investigation in the foot and was absolutely destroying any way of being able to investigate this case because once the person was publicly outed they would have been like okay well we are not going to give any more information. And that sucks because it seems as if this person, whoever this inmate was, had reliable information that only the killer would have known. So if this loudmouth candidate hadn't opened up their mouths and publicly announced this break in the case, we may have been able to know who the freeway phantom was and we may have been able to find out a little bit more information. Unfortunately, because this loudmouth decided to ruin that, this case may never be solved now. You know, and I'm not surprised that the inmate decided 
wanted to deny anything. I mean, you know, basically, it's like when you're outed, it's like, well, I don't know anything what you're talking about. Next, we come to Edward Sullivan and Tommy Simmons. So Sullivan and Simmons, two ex-cops, were arrested for the murder of Angela Denise Barnes. Barnes, 14, was at one point thought to be a victim of the serial killings. Authorities later determined that Barnes was not a victim of the Freeway Phantom and resumed their investigations on the murders. There was also Robert Askins. In March of 1977, a 58-year-old computer technician, Robert Edward Askins, was charged with abducting and raping a 24-year-old woman inside his Washington, D.C. home. Homicide detective Lloyd Davis proceeded to question Askins and learned that he had been charged with murder on several previous occasions. On December 28th of 1938, Askins, then a 19-year-old college student and a member of the science club at Minor Teachers College, served cyanide-laced whiskey to five prostitutes at a brothel, resulting in the death of 31-year-old Ruth McDonald. On December 30th, only two days later, he stabbed to death another prostitute, 26-year-old Elizabeth Johnson, at the same location. Upon his arrest, Askins declared to police that he was a woman-hater and was placed under mental observation at Washington, D.C.'s Gallinger Hospital, where, while there, he broke free of his restraints and assaulted three orderlies with a chair before being subdued. During his trial, it was revealed that he'd been a police informant aiding law enforcement in the arrest of prostitutes. In April 1939, Askins was found criminally insane and committed to St. Elizabeth's Hospital. Five months after being released in April 1952, Askins strangled 42-year-old Laura Cook to death. He was indicted for this murder in 1954, accused of several other assaults of similar circumstance, and retried for the 1938 murder. It having been determined that he was indeed sane upon committing the act, despite claiming he intended the cyanide for himself, planning suicide, he was convicted of secondary murder and sentenced to 20 years to life. This conviction was overturned in 1958. After the 1978 rape charge, Askins' home was searched by police in connection with the Freeway Phantom murders. Court documents were found in a desk drawer in which a judge had used the word tantamount, an uncommon word that had appeared in the note dictated by the killer of Brenda Woodard. Furthermore, colleagues at the National Science Foundations, where Askin was employed, reported that tantamount was a word that frequently cropped up in his speech. They also found soiled woman's scarves, photos of girls and young women, a knife used in another crime, and an essay from a girl. Another warrant was issued a month later, allowing police to search Askin's vehicle. They found two buttons and a gold earring under his back seat, records showed. But police didn't have the evidence to tie him to the deaths of any of the six girls. The green fibers found on five of the six victims didn't match the fibers found in his home or car, and hairs found in them came back negative. A search warrant was eventually obtained, and investigators dug through Askins' backyard. No physical evidence was obtained, and Askins was not charged in connection with the freeway phantom killings. Askin, who died at the Federal Correction Institution in Cumberland, Maryland on April 30th of 2010, at the age of 91, remained in prison for two Two DC era abductions and rapes in the mid 1970s, and had been contacted by both Davis and Press regarding the Freeway Phantom slayings. He denied any role in them, adding that he did not have the depravity of mind required to commit any of the crimes. One of the major clues into the Freeway Phantom's identity is that his geographical anchor point was St. Elizabeth's Hospital, a mental asylum in Washington, D.C. This suggests that the killer was familiar with the facility and likely means that he was either a patient, a doctor, or a worker who knew the area well. Another potential clue is that the Freeway Phantom appeared to keep keep trophies of his victims. Police have expressed their hope that someone might come across some of the tokens and alert investigators. Quote, he kept textbooks from one of the girls, curlers from another girl, shoelaces from another girl, noted Blaine Padro, who co-wrote a book on the murders. Some family members may stumble across these things and say, why did he keep this junk? He added, lastly, the freeway fandom stopped his crime spree in 1972. Investigators believe that that suggests he either died, was incarcerated, or moved away from the area at the time. There are several reasons why the freeway phantom has been so difficult to catch. He was probably charming and would probably have seemed like an unlikely suspect to the community. Quote, Organized killers are likely to be above average intelligent, attractive, married, or living with a domestic partner, employed, educated, skilled, orderly, cunning, and controlled. They have some degree of social grace, may even be charming, and often talk and seduce their victims into being captured, Psychology Today described. He was also forensically savvy enough to wash his victims' bodies to destroy a lot of evidence, and the Freeway Phantom's DNA has not been recoverable. He disposed of the bodies in different states, which investigators believe was designed to keep different police departments from piecing the crimes together. Though the FBI originally assigned around two dozen agents to the case, many were unfortunately pulled off the matter after the Watergate scandal gripped the capital. Lastly, the race of the victims also likely played a part. Quote, those black girls didn't mean anything to anybody. I'm talking about on the police department, end quote, claimed Tony Musgrove, who joined the DC police in 1972 and later headed the homicide unit. Quote, if those girls had been white, they would have put more manpower on it. There's no doubt about that, end quote, he added. With that, this case remains open, but with many unanswered questions, it still remains 
Unanswered. I'm your host, and this has been the Unanswered Questions podcast. Until next time, next on Unanswered Questions. The Kingsbury Run Torso Murderer, also known as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run, was an unidentified serial killer who was active in Cleveland, Ohio in the United States in the 1930s. 